Sekarang mari situ. Dipersilakan. in the dock and gave evidence 
In other words, he did not go into the witness stand and give evidence on oath, which means nobody could cross-examine him. And this is what he said. I am a black sheep who has to be sacrificed to protect unnamed people. Remember that? Now this is not for what he said in his caution statement that the police took. And the police on the 9th of November 2006 at the D6 division of Bukidama, Cyril gave what they call a section 113 statement to the recording officer. This statement took approximately three and a half hours to record. It was a very detailed statement, but what is of importance in that statement, I think, is the confession that he and his co-conspirator, um, Azila, had been offered 50 to 100,000 ringgit to settle this case. Now what, did that, what does that mean? So I think what we need to do is we need to actually look at, at Cyril's caution statement. We look at the contents. We will find details in that statement that only he would have known. He would only have known if he had actually done, the, not done this, this dastardly deed and if he had actually been at the scene of the crime. So let's look at the, the description that Cyril has given the police about what happened at the clearing in the Baluka in Fujagala. I'm just going to read you now what he has said in his caution statement so you understand the detail. He said this, after asking for the Chinese woman's article, remember, he still thinks this Mongolian girl is a Chinese woman. This goes to show that he had no idea who, he, who she was beforehand. The Chinese woman surrendered her jewelry. She then asked to be allowed to urinate. Azila brought her down from the jeep and I saw the Chinese woman urinating by the side of the jeep. After urinating, she saw the weapon that I was holding. I saw that she was in a state of fear and she pleaded not to kill her and said she was expecting. At the same time, Azila wrestled the woman to the ground and I could see that she had fallen and was in a state of unconsciousness. I opened fire to the left side of the woman's head. After the Chinese woman was shot, Azila removed all her clothes and I took a black garbage bag and Azila put all the Chinese woman's clothes into the bag. After putting all her clothes into the bag, Azila noticed movements in the Chinese woman's arm and ordered me to fire another shot, but the gun did not fire. I then emptied the weapon and loaded the gun again and fired another shot at the same area which was at the left side of the woman's head. I then took a black plastic garbage bag and with Azila's help put the bag over the Chinese woman's head to prevent blood from spilling. Now these are the sort of details that one can give only if they were actually involved. Now there is nothing to suggest that what Suru told the police was anything other than the truth. The specific details are sufficient proof that this could not possibly have been made up. So now we have a situation where it would appear that Cyril and Azila killed Arthur and Tuya and that they had been promised money to do this. Who wanted her killed? And who offered the money to do this? This is a question on everybody's mind, but no one seems interested in getting the answers. I'm not a police officer. I'm not trained in the subtle techniques involved in interrogation of, of suspects. But sheer common sense would dictate that in order to find out who was behind all this, it would be a very simple question to have asked Cyril, who offered to pay you this money? Very simple question, problem would have been solved. But the question wasn't asked. 
not in Cyril's caution statement. Now, if you look at the detail the interrogating officer managed to extract from Cyril in the four and a half hours, and I've only just read you a small section of his caution statement, the questions that seem to have looted the, the police is why would they do it? Why would Corporal Cyril and Azila shoot this woman? So let's turn to the trial now. The actual murder trial in the Shahla High Court. Never before in my entire career at the bar have I ever come across a situation in which the judge, the prosecution team, and the defense counsel have all been changed in such a short space of time before the trial. Bala was called as the very first prosecution witness. Remember, Bala's evidence has been tendered through the prosecution in support of the charges that they have brought against Azila and Cyril. Therefore, the answers he gave were in response to the questions the prosecutors asked him. And response to the questions that were asked of Bala by the defense counsel in cross-examination. This is how it works in court. Now, according to Bala, he was never asked any of the pertinent questions that he thought should have been asked from the statements he had given the police after being kept for a total of 14 days in the lockup. Every day from 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., Bala was interrogated. He told them everything he knew from A to Z. No one seemed to be interested in what he knew. All the statements he gave the police were edited, sanitized, made sure that nobody's name was mentioned at all. And this is what prompted Bala to come out with his first statutory declaration. He was disgusted that the trial was ongoing and none of this evidence he had was coming out. Now, this is where I'm going to try and approach this whole fiasco from a, from a different angle. But first let me emphasize that I have nothing personal against Najib. I feel that he has found himself in an unfortunate predicament he himself is creating. Now, if we study Bala's first SDPA in detail, we will notice there are a couple of subtle details which appear not to have been appreciated in the flurry of activity that has been precipitated ever since this first SD was, was released. The two issues here. Firstly, nowhere in that first statutory declaration did Bala make any mention of the fact that he felt Najib was involved in the murder of al -Tantuya. He never mentioned that and he never said it. Secondly, all Bala has said in that first statutory declaration is that both Raza Maginda and al -Tantuya told him that Al Tantuya used to be Najib's girlfriend. This allegation appears in only two paragraphs. Now what's the big deal? Half of Malaysian men have girlfriends. Why has it suddenly become very important? Now, let us pause here for a moment and think. Let's consider how the present situation would have been entirely different if the following had taken place. Number one, Najib had immediately, after the first SD was, was released, if Najib had immediately come out and denied any involvement with al Tantuya and said, just said, those allegations were all false and left it at that. But he didn't. But he very much later he did. Secondly, Remember, when Raza Bakinda was acquitted, he held a press conference two weeks afterwards. He said everything under the sun in that press conference. But if he had just simply said one thing, if he had just simply said, I did not tell Bala that 
that Alton Tudor used to be Nudge's girlfriend. Bala is telling lies. If only he had said that, it would have seriously affected Bala's credibility. Because Bala's statements were made and based on what he alleged, Raza had Beginda had told him. A couple with Najib denial, Bala would have been made to look a fool. But this did not happen. What happened after the first SD? We all know. Bala was immediately and unceremoniously bundled off to India with his family after a retraction of his first SD. The retraction in the second SD only referred to the paragraphs in the first SD where Bala had mentioned Najib's name. So it didn't become very suspicious. Secondly, the haste in which all this was organized in the space of 24 hours. This is reflective of a knee-jerk reaction to an innocuous situation, really. It resulted in, in basically fortifying what Bala had alluded to in his first SD. What happened to Bala after that first SD, unfortunately, has Najib's fingerprints all over it. So, let's sidetrack for a while. Let's look at our friend Deepak. Deepak Jayakishan. He was a mastermind behind getting Bala out of the country. The moral of the story is this. If you want to do something clandestine, never, never delegate. Now, Bala was informed by Deepak on the night of the 3rd of July that Rosbach had instructed him to get him out of the country post haste and to pay him off. Then, Bala was taken by Deepak to meet Najib's brother, Nazim. Nazim presented him with a very thinly veiled threat. If you care for your family's safety, you follow exactly what Deepak tells you. Nazim has yet to come out and deny this. Bala was then forced to sign the second statutory declaration when he was holed up in the Hilton Hotel, KL Central. At 8 a.m. in the morning, everybody had obviously been furiously preparing the second SD that night. This second SD was prepared by Cecil Abraham on the instructions of Najib from Raza. Now, this is not something I'm just saying. I have personal experience, yes. Cecil Abraham told me so. But, don't just rely on me. Deepak has himself confirmed all this in his press release on the 18th of January 2013. And let me read an excerpt from his press release. This is what Deepak said. What is most important is that both you and your wife meaning Najib and Rosma. Both you and your wife have come forward now to specifically reveal the truth to the entire Malaysian public on why she instructed me to reverse the SD-1 and why did both of you instruct Nasim Raza, Cecil and Suresh to do this unlawful reversal of the first SD in the first place. Isn't this because the first SD was the truth? And yet again, no comment, no response on these very damaging allegations. Now apart from all that, let us look at other incriminating factors here. And I am emphasizing once again, I am only referring to fact. I am not referring to conjecture. Now, this is obviously turning into now into a Bollywood production. But we know of the following. We know now that at the time Alton Tuya was abducted outside the house in Damansara belonging to Rasa Paginda, there was at that time a blue proton saga 
riding by very slowly. Azila and Cyril were already there, trying to get out of Tuyo in, into their car. Bala saw this car. He saw a Malay driver wind down the windscreen. Bala didn't know who this man was. Until some years later, when this driver of this proton hit the headlights because he's passed some disparaging remarks against other races in this country. Bar saw his photo on the um, internet news sites and immediately identified him as the driver of the proton. Nasir Safa was his name. Political advisor, secretary, assistant to Najib. What was he doing outside Raza Baginda's house on the night of the 19th of October 2006, the same night Al Tatuya was taken away? Secondly, Musa Safri, Najib's ADC, was communicating with Bala on his home phone outside Raza Baginda's house. This gentleman is a superior officer of both Cyril and Azila. Why was he interested in Al Tantuya? Thirdly, both Azila and Cyril were UTK personnel, special action force. And they were both bodyguards of Najib and they killed Al Tantuya. Now you make up your mind. With these facts presented to you, what conclusions are you going to draw? I don't intend to cast aspersions. These are facts in the public domain. Now let us look at the reaction of Raza Baginda the day he was arrested. But before I go anywhere near that, I need you to remember one thing. When Baha was with Raza Baginda, protecting him from Al Tantuya, Raza Bukinda was telling Bala about this VIP. The whole time Raza Bukinda was telling Bala about a VIP who was the boyfriend of Arthur Tuya who did who did that. Bala didn't know who this VIP was. Raza Bukinda didn't tell him. Maybe that's why Raza Bukinda felt insecure to release this information to Bala because Bala would not know who the VIP was that Raza Begina was talking about. But, again, fate sometimes deals a strange hand. And Bala, Raza Begina were in the office of Raza Begina's lawyer on the morning Raza Begina was arrested. Raza Begina received an SMS, the famous SMS. The SMS said, I am seeing the IGP at 11. Everything will be solved. Stay cool. Raza Baginda showed this SMS to Bala and showed this SMS to the lawyer. So there's at least one other living witness. And that is when Raza Baginda told everybody that it was Najib and that the VIP he had been referring to all along to Bala was Najib. Before that, Bala didn't know. As Bala and Raza Begida left that lawyer's office the day he was arrested and were traveling down in the lift to the ground floor, Raza Begida turned around to Bala and said, How I wish I had just paid Alton Duya the 500,000 US dollars then none of this would have happened. So as a postscript, how is all this related to Scorpion scandal that Suarov is so vigorously uh, pursuing in the French courts? Well, the link is obviously up to Tuya, ostensibly the official translator in all the negotiations with the French submarine manufacturers, DCNS, we presume but we don't really know. Perhaps this was the official title bestowed upon her by her boyfriends. 
Perhaps she felt used when the commission promise to her was not paid. And we all know hell hath no fury that a woman scorn. It has been established that Raza Baginda's company, Perry Baker, received approximately 500 million ringgit for the support services they provided for this deal. 500,000 US dollars that Alton, Alton Tia was asking for. This is equivalent to 0.3% of the entire commission. How things may have turned out so differently had she just been paid. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.